Well, it's the start of July, and you might be wondering what on earth, Drac, has happened to all your stuff from the trip to America? Well, the answer is it's um, all still here. I do have all the footage, but it's taking a while to sort through when you've uh, shot almost a third of a terabyte of footage. So given the time of year and given that some of the footage is now sorted, I thought I'd start everybody off with... A look at USS Constitution. Now we have already looked at USS Constitution before on the channel uh, from an analytical perspective of her battles, but nothing beats having a look at the ship itself. It was a relatively windy day, but hopefully most of the wind noise is damped out. So let's go and have a look at uh, the day I spent on USS Constitution, which was the second day of the trip. So spoiler alert, the next video from the trip will be on USS Salem, uh, but that won't be for a few more weeks. Okay, so this is day two of the Great America tour, and we find ourselves still in Boston. It's a wonderful, wonderful day, despite the fact we're on roughly the same latitude as the UK, the weather is a lot better. It is a little windy, but clear skies and sun and all that's all good. And as you can see behind me, we have the second oldest commissioned warship in the world. USS Constitution, of course, famous super frigate of the War of 1812 and a variety of other exploits that perhaps go a little bit less well recorded. And today I'm going to attempt to do something that no British captain was ever successfully able to do and board the USS Constitution. So let's go have a look inside. And hey, no issues with the Second Amendment just yet. <laughs> so here we are on the upper deck. Um, obviously, as a frigate, there is no quarter deck, no poop deck, etc. It is flush deck, stem to stern. And this is, or was, obviously this one is not a uh, original, but this would have been one of Constitution's main elements of firepower. Now, on a lot of frigates on the upper deck, you would have had light guns, 9-pounders, 12-pounders, maybe the odd 18-pounder. Um, but this, as you can see, starts here and the barrel ends just here. So it's actually a very short gun. And that's because this is a 32 pounder carronade. So it's a much, much shorter weapon than a cannon. Doesn't have tremendously long range compared to a long gun, which we'll see further down. Uh, but at short range, it can throw a much, much heavier ball than the average upper deck gun for the average frigate. Not even accounting for the fact that Constitution is already substantially larger and substantially more heavily built than the average frigate. So this is one of the keys to Constitution's victories because most of her fights are fought at very close range. And at very close range, this thing has a lot of options. Not only can you shoot at the enemy with ball um, to just smash up their timbers, but you can also, due to the large volume, fire a significant amount of grape shot or some other kind of canister shot to clear the decks of enemy borders, which obviously stops people attacking you as much as it assists you in attacking them. So, very useful. The other thing that you might note is that, as with most carronades, and unlike most cannons, these things are not on your traditional four-wheeled carriages. These are on carriages which are fairly solid. You can see you've got a wedge here to allow you to change the elevation of the gun. Um, but the actual wheeled part of the gun is these much, much smaller wheels. And that allows you, by means of ropes like this, and this handle and these sockets here to adjust the angle of the gun going backwards and forwards so that you can shoot at an enemy that's slightly aft of you or slightly fore of you instead of just having to wait for them to be directly broadside. You can later on see a modified version of this carronade that has a screw thread through here which allows you to elevate it a bit more precisely than the old wooden wedge but you know this works fairly well for the War of 1812. Okay, so back up there you can see the Stars and Stripes flying. That is the ship's battle ensign. So this is a very important part of the ship because this not only tells you who the ship belongs to, which is quite helpful if the paint job hadn't already given that away, but this is also how you tell whether the ship is still in action. So if a ship was beaten, you would either have its colors shot away or lowered and when the colors are no longer there, that was the internationally accepted signal, and to a certain degree still is, that the ship has in fact surrendered. You don't need to hoist a white flag or anything like that. You can just strike your colors. That's literally where the term comes from. 
and so having this thing up there is critically important during battle. It's seen as incredibly dishonorable to strike your colors falsely, recover yourself, and then go back into the fight uh, to the point you could be thrown out of your own navy for doing so. Uh, because it would undermine the reliability and the honor and the integrity of your entire navy. Constitution, of course, never struck her colors to anybody, and her flag is still flying, as she is, of course, a commissioned warship, the second oldest commissioned warship in the world, and the oldest commissioned warship that's still afloat, because the only ship that's older is HMS Victory, and, of course, she's in dry dock. Okay, and just above where the ensign is mounted, you can see we have an aft-pointing yard, which is coming back off of the mizzen mast. Now this is a very important piece of ship design in the 18th century because fore and aft sails, which is what most of the sails are, mounted on the yards that are perpendicular to the ship's hull, which you can see up, on, up there on the mast, those are great for going forwards. They're not so great for manoeuvring when the wind is anything other than in your aft quarter. So these two aft pointing yards allow you to put a very large sail which can then catch the wind from the side, which then gives you both control and propulsion when the wind is coming in from odd angles. So that helps a ship like Constitution to maneuver in all sorts of directions. Obviously, she still can't sail directly into the wind. No sailing ship can at this point in history, but it means that she can maneuver around her opponents in a way that an enemy that lacks either this particular setup or perhaps lacks a sail that's of this kind of size wouldn't be able to do. Of course, it is a point of vulnerability because if somebody shoots away the mizzen mast and that sail goes away, then her, she lacks a fair bit of agility. But the designers weren't entirely stupid. They did include for other sails of this type all along the ship's rigging, um, particularly off of the bowsprit. But you could, as you can see with these lines running from the higher portions of the mast down to the lower portions, you could also, in a pinch, rig Sim similar sails fore and aft between the masts. And as you can see, the other thing that Constitution has over Victory at the moment is that she is in fact fully rigged. So you can see the true beauty of a fully rigged ship of war from the late 18th early 19th century. So there's a lot of rope that needs to be keeping the ship's masts and yards aloft because this is her source of propulsion. All the weight of the guns, the crew, the ship's hull, etc. All of that has to be pushed through the water, and as a frigate, she has to move through the water pretty quick, and all of that force is being transmitted through these masts. If they weren't rigged as heavily as they are, even though these masts are several feet thick, they would snap like matchwood the minute the wind picked up. So all this rigging helps keep the masts in place, not just when it's under propulsion, but also when the ship is pitching and rolling, because you can imagine with those fighting platforms up there, and the sheer height of it, if the ship is rolling, that's going to create incredible forces left and right, or port and starboard, which could result in the mast just snapping off. And that was a very significant danger in battle. A lot of the time when masts collapsed in battle, it wouldn't necessarily be from the enemy shooting the mast through, although that could and did happen. It could also be from enemy shot having cut enough of the rigging that when the ship healed, the mast would just go over with a, a good blow of wind. So definitely something worth seeing. But of course, um, I rather doubt anyone's gonna let me climb up there. I'd be perfectly willing to try it, but I have a suspicion that the health and safety risk assessment would probably be a volume almost equal to Constitution's battle record. So uh, I have a feeling we're gonna be staying well down here on the main deck. So this is the ship's, well, it's spelt gunwale. Most people call it a gunnel and this is part of the ship's protective system. You can see here we've got some netting. Um, you could stuff all sorts of things, usually hammocks in here as well. Now, obviously, as you can see, the ship's sides are quite thick. Um, slightly commonly repeated myth, Constitution is not built to the specs of a ship of the line. Her ribbing is a bit closer together than the average frigate, so she has the ribbing framework of a ship of the line, but the hull thickness, although it is quite thick, is not quite up to ship of the line standards. But to be fair, she's a big frigate. That's not exactly a mark against her. She is still immensely strong. And the fact that she's still here is testament to that amongst other things. But the purpose of this is, as you might imagine, to shelter people from incoming fire. The ship's built from a mixture of live oak and white oak, which is very, very tough wood, uh, which also helps protect the crew. 
and at long range, frigate grade gunfire, 12 pounders or 18 pounders, could bounce off or embed themselves in the hull. But it's not like ironclad armour in the latter part of the 19th century. At close range, even a 12 or 18 pounder ball will still come through this oak. Um, with a lot of splinters, it's not a particularly good thing to have happen to you. Um, but, you know, no armour is perfect. The fact that, if you like, this wooden armour could fail at close range, again, isn't a mark against Constitution. The fact that she has it at all and that she has that protection at longer to medium ranges is a huge step up above most frigates. And this is where her name Old Ironsides, or her nickname Old Ironsides, comes from, because it's much, much easier to survive a sea battle if you're on one of the six original frigates, of which obviously Constitution is one, without too many injuries and too many deaths amongst your crew when you have this kind of protection going on. One of the ways that you can actually tell that this kind of damage at close range did happen is that when you look at Constitution's victories, Java, Guria, and Macedonian being of course the most famous, when the British ship is beaten into submission, she doesn't immediately take the surrender Constitution actually hauls off for a little bit of time to make good her own damage, which of course tells you that she had taken damage, which, you know, a bit of a giveaway there, but the, the main thing is, yes, she'd taken damage, but she hadn't taken anywhere, anywhere near as much damage as the other guy, because they were the ones who'd surrendered. So it's effectively, if you imagine a bar fight, if someone's going, yeah, you know what, fine, I give up, maybe you got them on the floor or whatever, just because you take a step back to recover your breath, mop a few cuts and bruises that you've got before you step in and go, right, okay, and don't do that again, that doesn't mean you lost the fight. <laughs> it just means, you know, you're being a bit sensible about things. And you've got to remember that not only is this part of the ship's protection, this is also part of the ship's hull. And that goes obviously all the way down. So only a fool after a battle would immediately start worrying about taking over the other ship when there are potentially holes and other forms of damage in his own ship. You know, you have, <laughs> this thing has to stay afloat after the battle as well. Just winning the battle and sinking because you left a hole at the waterline isn't a good thing. Um, but obviously she was correctly patched up, sufficiently patched up and was able to tow in quite the number of prizes. So here we are at the ship's bow, um, patriotic music apparently obligatory, um, and what you might notice is a few things. One, we have here a position for a bow chaser, so obviously if you're chasing your opponent, your broadside gun's not the world's most useful weapons. You can, when you're pursuing an enemy, turn port and starboard and basically weave and fire your broadsides, but of course that means you're describing a much longer course, and given that you're wind driven, you may be pulling into areas where the wind isn't propelling you quite as efficiently so you have to have a lot of a speed advantage over your opponent to be able to pull that off and given that constitution's main prey are other frigates she might be faster than them she's not that much faster than them that she can easily risk, risk that all the time and so the bow chaser position on most age of sail warships is an absolutely excellent idea because it means you can have a gun here and you can shoot at your opponent with minimal to no course change Granted, you only have one position here, one position on the opposite side, but the enemy's going to be similarly restricted with his stern chasers, and of course he's already running from you, so you don't have to worry about that too much. Another thing that's quite interesting to note, up here on the bowsprit, you can see these little steps. Now obviously there's a little bit of um, modern anti-skid on the steps themselves, but that does give away a bit of a clue, and you know some of the pads up there. On this yard across at the front, there would be, or could be, another sail. And that sail would have to be furled, unfurled, managed, etc. And there's some rigging there as well, so that if that got damaged, people would have to go up and fix that. And you can't just wait to go back into port to sort that out. This kind of stuff has to be sorted at the time whilst the ship is at sea. And that's where someone would have to go. And now, there is a modern safety line running up the side, but back in the day, not only would the ship be moving and pitching and rolling and swaying and potentially people also shooting at you, but you'd be running up there without the anti-skid, probably in bare feet because, you know, that, that's a modicum of safety compared to wearing shoes at the time, but you'd have to be running up the bowsprit to do whatever it was the captain needed you to do and then hope that you can make it back again. Now, there is a little bit of more wooden construction here beyond 
the structural bow of the ship, which gives it a bit more of a forward peak, but that is, as I say, it's not structural, it's just designed, well, I'd say for aesthetic, but partly for sea keeping as well. So that's the bow here, and obviously we've got the this big block and tackle system with a bunch of really nice thick ropes. This is actually going all the way back to the main mast. So for reference, on most ships at the time, uh, which have most ships, whether they're frigates or ships of the line, they will have three masts. So you have the foremast, which is the one, obviously, the forwardmost mast. You have the main mast, which is amidships, which is usually the biggest mast. And then you have the mizzen mast, which is usually the aft mast. Now, obviously, you could get a four or five masted ship, and then they have other names for that, mostly based on early medieval terms, which is was the last time that anyone built a warship with more than three masts. Three masts kind of became the standard. Uh, but if you only have two masts, you are classed as a brig. So you're not a ship, you're a brig now. Um, and this also explains why on later warships, perhaps a World War I or World War II uh, battleship or a cruiser, you'll see a mast coming up somewhere around about the bridge or just after the bridge, and that'll be the foremast. That's all understandable, perfectly fine. But then you see another mast on an iron or steel vessel, and it might be right back. It'll be before the behind the funnels, might actually be you know, right back as far as the aft turret, and it'll be called the main mast. And you might think, well, why is it the main mast? It's right at the back. And that's because masts are always counted from the for from forward. So first mast is foremast, second mast is main mast, and if you don't have a third mast, it doesn't matter where that second mast is, it's still the main mast. Um, and the one thing you don't want to be doing is standing before the mast, because that usually means someone's about to hit you with a whip. <laughs> and at the moment we've got a sea shanty going, so if you can hear that, you can try and figure out which one it is. Anyway, this is another 32 pound carronade, so you've already seen one of those on the aft starboard quarter. But over here, we see a long gun, and you can immediately tell the difference, whereas the carronade barrel basically stops at this netting in its current position. This cannon, as you can see, the carriage is pretty much at the same position aft, but firstly, the bascule of this gun is right at the back of the carriage, whereas the bascule of the carronade is about two, three foot further forward, and then, you have another three to four foot of gun going past the netting, it's hence long gun. So this is uh, part of the ship's main armament. Obviously, this weapon is a much longer range weapon for a given value of long range. It is the age of sail, after all. And as you can see, it's also on a far more traditional naval carriage. So big wooden wheels, slight four of them, two slightly larger forward, two slightly smaller aft. Same kind of ropes to restrict the recoil, and you can see from the rings, there would be, if this gun was going into action, the same with the carronade, considerably more ropes. You wouldn't just have the one, because apart from anything, just, just this on its own, that'll stop the gun going back, but gives you no ability to wheel the gun forward again once you've reloaded it. So this is, this is somewhat reduced compared to its full rope rig. Constitution's main advantage, which we'll see down on the lower gun deck, as compared to other frigates, wasn't just her speed, her size, and the material she was built of, it was also her armament, because the average frigate of that day, fifth rate or sixth rate, would carry, one, fewer guns than she does, because she's big, but secondly, the main guns, the long guns of most frigates would either be 12 pounders or 18 pounders. Some ships would have actually quite small nine pounder armaments, although it's very difficult to get a nine pounder armed ship rated as a frigate. But 12 and 18 pounders, okay, fine. Lots of 12 pounder frigates, some 18 pounder frigates, but Constitution's long guns down on the main gun deck are 24 pounders. <laughs> So they're the same kind of poundage as the guns you'd find on the midship's deck of a ship of the line, or possibly sometimes the lowest gun deck of a two-decker, like a third rate. And that gives her, at long range, a much heavier punch than other frigates of the time, for the most part. There are a few other frigates out there with 24 pounders, but you have to build a frigate fairly big and fairly hefty in order to accommodate a 24 pounder. And quite frankly, most of the big navies at the time, France, UK, Spain, 
usually didn't have the time to invest in large numbers of these kinds of super frigates. They preferred to have slightly less capable frigates, but in much, much larger numbers because they could afford that. So that's why we have just the one long gun here. So this, this long gun, for example, would be a bow chaser because it's got the range. You wouldn't really bow chase with a carronade. Um, but we're going to go down onto the main gun deck and have a look at her main battery. And now it's time to head down onto the gun deck. So we're now on the lower deck, well, one deck lower than the main deck, so we're on the main gun deck. And uh, the sunglasses come off because the fine Boston sunshine is now safely trapped behind a layer of wooden planking. And as you can see, we're besides the 24 pounder main armament, nice big chunky guns. And well, as I said on the upper deck, this is really what gives Constitution its firepower. This, is, this allows you to attack pretty much any other frigate that's out there with a very high chance of success because you just simply outgun them. I mean, forget the speed advantages, the durability advantages, even if Constitution was built exactly the same as any other frigate, these guns alone will give her a significant advantage when it comes to shooting up the enemy because they are so much heavier. It doesn't mean she can take on a ship of the line. Okay, so if you, for those of you thinking, oh, can Constitution take on victory? No. <laughs> um, these 24 pounders are approximately equivalent to the middle deck battery of HMS Victory. And HMS Victory has a third gun deck below that, which has 32 pounders, which are much heavier even than these. And she has a gun deck, full gun deck above that. And she has an upper deck, which would have not quite the same carronade armament as we saw up there, but it does have even more guns and a couple of 68 pounder carronades, which you really don't want to mess with, just ask Bucentar. But still, um, it would maybe give Constitution a fighting chance against a fourth rate ship of the line. Now the fourth rate, by the time Constitution is in service, has kind of gone out of fashion, but there are still a number of them, 52 gunners, 56 gunners, and 64 gunners still in various fleets. And Constitution, when she's fully kitted up, has almost as many guns and her firepower is probably about equal. So very, very big frigate fighting very small ship of the line. Possibility of victory. Now, one of the other things you might notice is if you see videos of me in victory or some other places, if you're on the main gun deck, you do have to stoop a bit or you have to find a convenient section between beams to stand up in. One of the good features of frigates is that because someone's ringing a bell, <laughs> one of the best features about frigates is that because they only have the one gun deck they can afford for that gun deck to be a little bit taller anyway and because constitution is as i said before a larger frigate on top of that it means that my six foot nothing of height can quite happily walk straight under the beams without even a risk of clocking my head. I mean, I've got my glasses on my head and even if I stand on my tiptoes, I can't even knock my glasses off. So I'm really liking this particular design feature. Um, and you can see on the sides here, again, like we saw up at the gunnels, the sides of the ship are pretty darn thick. And each of the guns now seems to have a nameplate. So <laughs> that's not to help the gunners work out where they should be because, you know, they know where, where they should be. They, they live, fight and sleep here. Um, but it does help with a bit of familiarity with those weapons. Uh, and you can just see how heavily built the ship is. Critical importance though, looking fore and aft, you can literally see the bow there. You could see all the way to the stern. There are no bulkheads in an Asia Sail ship of the line. So if water comes in the gun ports, you're in trouble. But that's another benefit of both being a frigate and being a constitution style super frigate. These gun ports are pretty high above the water. So the chances of the water shipping in through the gun ports and going down Mary Rose style are pretty low. Um, it also gives you a slight advantage against some ships of the line. Um, the combat between Amazon Indefatigable and Duarte de Lomme comes to mind in that a small ship of the line, a 74 for example, would not be able to keep its lower gun ports open in heavy seas, whereas a frigate could. So if you're talking about something like a 74 gunner, something like Constitution could potentially outgun such a ship of the line if the weather was bad, because she'd be able to operate these 24 pounders when a 74 would be stuck with only 12 or 18 pounders on the upper gun deck. Okay, so here we can see the primary stove 
pretty much the only big stove, so this is the ship's galley. Now, whereas on a ship of the line, you might find this couple of decks down, possibly even lower, of course, again, on a frigate with significantly fewer decks, you have to kind of fit everything in as best you can where you can. And so in this case, it's here in the forward part of the gun deck. They would, of course, put the fire out before any kind of combat because the last thing you need on a wooden ship is a cannonball coming through the side of the ship hitting this thing and kicking a bunch of em boiling hot embers all over the ship. What you can see to either side of the galley are these things. These are for the anchor cables. You can see one of them is kind of loosely wrapped here and there's another one over there. And that lets the ship's anchors out through this block, which you can see here, which has a uh, screw powered tensioner and out through that green plate that you can see just behind it. So that's how you keep the ship at rest and know you're not doing any battleship movie style handbrake turns with them. Um, frankly, in most water will be too deep anyway and even if you did it in shallow water, the chances are you probably either snap the rope or rip these things out of the hull before you did a, you know, a, a, a point turn. Albeit that if you're ever gonna stand a chance of doing it at all without causing massive damage to the ship, a uh, Age of Sail frigate is probably one of the better candidates. But what you can also see down here is another bow chaser position. And of course, there'd be a matching one on the other side. And you can see also the bow sprits coming down here. So you've only got the two positions on the upper deck which have the best visibility. So if you're ranging at long distance, those are probably the two that are gonna give you the best chances. But down here, you've got a couple more. So perhaps if you're getting to medium or close range in your chase, you can supplement your firepower. In theory, you could put bow chasers there for the whole chase and try shooting at your opponent, but one, you are slightly lower, and two, as you can probably appreciate, the visibility is nowhere near as good, so the chances of you getting accurate shooting from down here are much less than if you're up top. Um, and again, you know, this is the forward part of the ship, that's literally where the ship ends, and it's guns from here all the way down to the far end. So this is the aft section of the gun deck and as you can see it's not entirely the end of the gun deck, there are actually gun ports here. So all of this furniture, which is of course for the ship's senior staff, would be cleared away in a time of combat in order to allow the ship to bring more firepower to bear. But as you can see it's not a tremendously great amount of the ship. If you've seen some of the clips I took on HMS Victory, this entire area for the ship's officers about the size of maybe Victory's great cabin, but obviously somewhat subdivided. So you've got a cot there and you can see some of the uh, glazing that's right up on the stern. So Constitution, another way of telling her apart from British, French or Spanish made frigates in the War of 1812 is her stern structure. It is quite distinctive. Most of the European frigates would have a much more rounded top to their sterns. Constitutions is almost, not quite, but almost flush flat across the top. And that does lend her a very distinctive aft profile. And the fact that she's painted black and white also helps. Obviously the British colors by the War of 1812 are a yellow ochre and black, the Nelson Checker. The French at this point have just about begun to adopt some kind of uniform color procedure as well, although their sides of their hulls are much more monocolor. The US Navy color scheme at this point, black hull with white striping. Now we pause at this point to allow a tour group to come past, and I started trying to record a segment on this rather wonderful display of ammunition. However, um, while I was doing that, some other tourists saw me looking vaguely presentable and decided that, of course, I must work for the ship and began asking me questions about the ammunition. And I couldn't resist giving them what should have been a relatively short lecture on types of age of sale ammunition. And I think ended up turning into about a 40 minute discussion of ammunition, guns and everything else. So, yeah, poor old cameraman here relegated to the back while he um, took the occasional candid camera shot of me talking to a bunch of tourists who had no idea that I didn't actually work for the Constitution <laughs> Museum. But there you go. Anyway, back on with the regular tour once everyone had uh, moved on. Okay. Okay. Right, so here we have some of the shot that Constitution would use. You've got round shot, 24 pounder round shot, fairly standard. 
all-purpose ammunition. You can double or triple load it for short-range combat if you really want. And of course you have your round shot gauge because if it's been manufactured and it's not close to perfectly spherical, I mean it's never going to be perfectly spherical, but you don't want it to be too oblong because then it might get stuck in the gun barrel. And uh, yeah, well, that does bad things because you've effectively then invented a very, very large three to five ton pipe bomb and uh, well that never ends well for whoever does that so the shot gauge is always very important you pass that over the shot to make sure it will fit you've got canister shot for your mid mid-range anti-personnel purposes uses smaller balls like this all wrapped up as you can see in cloth put on a platform that platform goes in the gun all of this cloth and string disintegrates when you fire the gun these will fly out like a big shotgun blast this will damage rigging, punch holes in sails, punch holes in people. Um, pretty nasty anti-personnel shot. You've got your double-headed shot, kind of like a barbell. You also get double-headed shot that is literally like a barbell with uh, basically two round shots stuck together. This is good at damaging masts. Very good at damaging masts, actually. I mean, all of this was very good at damaging people as well um, in various horrific ways, but ideally, this is what you shoot at a mast. Star shot. Again, all closed up so it can fit down the barrel. When it's fired, these will open up, hence the name Star. This particular model, as you can see, has heavy weights on the ends of the bars. Other models have, uh, don't have these weights, will have lesser weights, but will have more of these. And the idea of this is to punch a hole in the ship's sail. Although, again, you wouldn't want to be hit by one. But if you punch a hole in the ship's sail, then, you know, three, four foot hole, that's not brilliant. Okay, the, the mast, or the sail on the mast might be the size of a tennis court, so you might think that's not so much of a problem, but there's a huge amount of energy going into that sail. And when that happens, the energy that's going through that, being pushed into that sail by the wind will find a weakness, like say the shot you just punched, the hole you just punched with a star shot, and rip straight through it, and that'll blow the sail out. So, starts weaknesses, and the, the wind exploits them. Canister shot, your short-range anti-personnel shot, no real capability for going through the ship's hull, but the fragments, kind of like the grape shot being a big shotgun blast, the canister shot is an even bigger shotgun blast, almost exclusively for anti-personnel use. So this is what you use either to clear the enemy decks before you board them, or if they're massing to board you, well, wipe out the boarding party before they get to you. That's always a good idea. And then you have the bar shot, and this is very good for taking out rigging, again would also quite happily clothesline anyone it gets in the way, but this will expand out into a very long, as its name suggests, series of bars, and that will catch, wrap around, and rip through the ship's rigging. And that's good on multiple counts, because one, well, lots of ropes flying around is bad. Two, it means if there's damage to the sails or the mast from any of this stuff, if the rigging's cut, then the sailors on the enemy ship can't climb the rigging to go and repair it. And also, um, as we mentioned when we're looking up up on the uh, upper deck the bar shot if it cuts enough of the rigging then the masts might actually collapse and go over the side anyway now we are one deck lower than the gun deck and as you can see the uh, height of the hull has gone down a bit so now i'm having to shelter between the main beams now as you may recall, if you've seen the video on HMS Unicorn, much like HMS Unicorn, where again, I was mostly able to stand in the gun deck area, I now can't stand one deck lower, so this hull level is a little bit shorter. And like the later class, you can see this is another area for accommodation. So again, like the later class, there's not enough room on the gun deck for all the crew. Some of them will live and sleep and fight there but a good chunk of them will be accommodated down here. And you can see how the hammocks would be stored when they're not in use. And you can see over here how a hammock would be deployed when it is in use. And this is a fairly important area of the ship because obviously we're now not quite below, fully below the waterline, but this is in completely enclosed and this is where a good chunk of the crew are gonna spend a good chunk of their time. The later class, and the reason there's so much similarity between the later class, i.e. Trincomalee and Unicorn nowadays, and Constitution, is that 
to a greater or lesser degree, the labor class is actually built in response to ships like Const Constitution. So the fact that they've got very, very similar methods of accommodation, very, very similar kinds of main battery, shouldn't be too much of a surprise, especially since by the point that the later class are really undergoing mass production, the British are kind of cribbing notes from the USS President. Okay, we are now three decks down in the ship. And as you can tell, we are rapidly running out of ship. This is the part of the stern. So we've got the mizzen mast coming down just there. Obviously, it's also being used as a water storage area. Um, but you can see part of the ship structure. So this is one of the part of the ship's framing coming up. We've got several of these. And you can see these are absolutely massive timbers. This is part of what lends the ship so much strength. But you can also see how raked the stern is because this is, you know, yeah, this is probably the lowest single continuous deck on the ship. But we're not that close to the stern. Above us, actually directly above us, is the end of the gun deck. So there's still, we're basically pretty much under the divide between the gun deck and the officer's quarters. And the officer's quarters go back a fair distance that way. So, you know, this is very very quickly raking down underwater and this is part of the secret to the constitution's speed and the speed of her sister ships when they're properly trimmed the hydrodynamic form of their stern is a lot has a lot sharper rake than a lot of frigates of the time and that helps the water flow of course there's no propeller um, so, but there is a rudder, so it also helps the water flow over the rudder, which helps them with the, their agility, because Constitution is a relatively rare beast in the Age of Sail, in that it is both fast and fairly agile. Most of the time, you could get one, but not the other. <laughs> so British ships of the time tend to be more agile. French and Spanish ships of the time tend to be a bit faster. You do get the occasional unicorn, <laughs> which can do both. But Constitution and her sisters, when they, when they are being properly trimmed, actually can do that by design. And this is one of the little secrets of it, the fact that uh, the, the hull is so shaped underwater. But of course, as you can also tell, <laughs> the deck has gotten even lower, which is why I'm bringing this to you leaning against the side rather than standing up, because even if I am between the main beams here, which I am, if I stand up, that is about as okay so i can stand up vertically if i basically had no head which is not really a situation i particularly like finding myself in so that's the right after the constitution let's have a look at a few other bits and pieces down here on the lowest deck where is the precious Okay, and now we are actually below the last deck. We are literally in the void spaces of the Constitution. Um, there, there is nowhere below here other than probably 15 foot of Boston Harbor, which I'd rather not be in. So apologies for the slight noise you might be able to hear, but of course they do have the HVAC systems going constantly down here for rather obvious reasons. But as I say, this is literally the lowest you can possibly get in the ship before we were in the lowest part of the decked area but these are the lowest planks of the ship i'm standing with my right foot here on the keel so that's the central spine of the ship that's running aft obviously and this is the deck we were on a minute ago just above us you can see the hull raking up um, here again we're near the stern and right down here when the ship was in service, this is where the ballast would have been. This is where the stores would have been. And it's not just in terms of water and of course alcohol, because the US Navy was not dry at this point. Uh, food, some of the ships, okay, most of the ships, rats, would have also lived down here, as of course would any ships, cats or dogs, whose job it was to keep make sure the rat population was kept under control. Um, as you would have seen in other Age of Sail ships that we visited, spare rope storage, ammunition, so cannon shot, etc., would be stored near the guns, but there would be more down here in magazines. And of course, the other thing that would be down here, well, not literally where I'm standing now, but just above us and just a bit forward, would be the main magazine where the gunpowder is stored. 
because, well, it's the only safe place for it to be stored. So this deck and the, well, this void space and the deck we were above are below the waterline, and there's a very, very good reason for keeping all that gunpowder down here. Well, I mean, obviously, apart from the fact you need to use it to, uh, you know, shoot the guns, but a ship like this might be carrying dozens of tons of gunpowder. So a ship like this, if it's carrying dozens of tons of gunpowder in the main magazine, you do not want that to catch fire. If it catches fire, this is just so much hope, streams and splinters. So it has to be kept below the water, it has to be kept safe. Of course, the iron ammunition has no explosion risk. You can store that wherever you like, but the gunpowder definitely has to be kept down here. And copper line magazine, pretty much like HMS Victory, People would run the charges up uh, through a kind of airlock system. It's not actually an airlock system, but it's the closest modern equivalent we can think of. Or maybe you call it an interlock system to make sure that no sparks get in there. And uh, well, if a one ton of gunpowder can destroy the Houses of Parliament, 30 tons of gunpowder, yeah, you'd be lucky to pick up bits of the mast from a mile away. And of course, the fact that we're here means that never happened because Unlike certain people, the US Navy crew of this ship understood magazine safety procedures. And speaking of magazines, the crew were incredibly helpful during our tour of the ship, and they pointed out where one of the ship's magazines actually was. So this, and also allowed us in. Um, now, as you can see, this is, of course, as I said, copper lined. Everything is copper lined, except for the modern light bulb there. And this is at one of the extreme ends of the ship, and of course being deep down, you can tell it's just a little claustrophobic. We're basically taking these pictures lying on our sides, and hence that's why I didn't shoot any live video in the magazine. It would have been a hilariously undignified way of talking to people. And you might notice there is quite a lot of this white paste on there. That's because they're in the process of cleaning it. So you can see some areas where it has been cleaned, some areas where patina has built up, and some areas where this cleaning chemical is currently in the process of cleaning up existing patina. And of course, in the magazine, you want to store anything that might go boom. So there'll be boxes of grenades, as well as fuses for those grenades, and as you can see, various kinds of powder. This would obviously have to be broken down into individual charges, but it would be stored long term in these barrels, deep in the magazines, deep in the ship. The copper sheeting of the magazine would of course be accompanied by the use of copper and wooden tools, absolutely no iron permitted in any way, shape or form to avoid striking sparks, and that would allow you to safely handle the gunpowder and turn it into bag charges ready for use. You can also see the absolute deepest and oldest part of the ship, just around this area, so this is part of the original keel and original planking, as you can see narrowing quite significantly at this end of the ship where this magazine is located. And just outside the magazine, you have quills, which are useful for the priming of the guns, various tools. You can see most of those there are copper and a few that aren't wouldn't be allowed in the magazine itself with some empty charge bags and you've got scoops and so forth, a spare powder bag, and of course, some pre-made charges ready to go. And the different colors would signify, as far as I was going to understand, do the different guns that those charges would then be used in. Now, exiting the ship, we also found this delightful little creature. So this is the subject of many memes online um, from f people who have taken photos of it or found photos of it over p p various periods. This is Constitution's own little pet tugboat. And it, yes, <laughs> it is a US Navy vessel, and it is the most adorable towing vessel on the planet. It lives just to the starboard of Constitution. Now, I was there thinking to myself, well, this has been a really successful day. We've toured Constitution from top to bottom, well, with the exception of the actual fighting tops. The crew have been absolutely wonderful. Now I should go and get myself a US Constitution baseball cap. But then they mentioned that they had something special in mind for me. OK, I thought this should be good. Let's head back on the ship. I was not expecting what was about to happen. OK, everyone, here we are after hours aboard USS Constitution. And as you might notice, this gun looks a little bit more active than all the others because we are going to fire it. And uh, well, I'd say helping me fire it, to be honest, he knows what he's doing a lot more than I do. Hey, everyone, I'm GM2 Nieves. It's Gunner's Mate 2nd Class, Petty Officer Nieves. I'm the United States Navy. I'm a Gunner's Mate. 
right here in my hand, I have a 40 millimeter, 200 gram round that I'm gonna be loading into our Mark 11 Mod 2 saluting battery. The purpose of this is to execute evening colors when we bring down our American flag and then for all the lost military members. And not only us, the US Constitution brings down our American flag, but the sound of this gun, also the N NPS, National Park Services, and Coast Guard Base are gonna listen to this, this gun to uh, execute their colors as well. Colors is at sunset, evening colors at sunset. And the time today, April 10th, 2022, is 7.20 p.m. Right now what I'm doing, I'm checking my sights, sights clear. I'm checking my sights two minutes prior. As a gunner's mate, you always make sure the gun is clear and safe before you mess with it. So I have a live round. I'm gonna insert it into the sleeve battery. I have permission to fire on the command batteries release. And now the gun is loaded. We have two minutes to colors. I'm gonna check again at one minute to colors. To make sure the sights are clear at 30 seconds. That's standby. And uh, the uh, wonderful people for Constitution have, a, have let me have the great honor of actually firing the gun today. So uh, at the command, I shall fire the weapon. <laughs> Absolutely. Which will be the first time I've fired a gun of this caliber before. <laughs> this is a, a, like again, a 40 millimeter, 200 gram round. This gun has a concussion radius of 50 feet. Sight's clear. So what I'm doing is checking 30 degrees left and right of the barrel and 100 feet down just for safe measures. And I'm looking for personnel in the water, kayakers, small boats, anything here. The sights aren't clear. I'm with the CDO now and we'll hold off on firing until we get that cleared away. CDO DCC, 30 seconds to evening colors. 30 seconds to evening colors, I break down crew check sights. Sights clear. Sights clear, I. Now I'm with my air pro on. CDO DCC, stand by. Stand by, I break down crew check sights. did say so we very loud and that concluded an absolutely wonderful day aboard USS Constitution again huge huge thanks to the uh, USS Constitution crew for both sorting that out and obviously giving me the honor to fire the gun that signals colors for that particular day uh, it was certainly something I wasn't expecting but something I hugely enjoyed and of course um, respect and of course I was able to therefore add my own signature to the book of USS Constitution Gunners. So that's a little permanent record, which is quite fun. So there you have it. A quick look aboard USS Constitution, the second oldest commissioned warship in the world and the oldest 
floating commissioned warship in the world. I uh, highly recommend you go visit her in Boston Harbour. There is also a Fletcher-class destroyer, the Cassin Young, just over behind her uh, in this picture. Also definitely worth a visit, although we only got to see her from an external perspective because there was limited time. Of course, the world's cutest tugboat there down to the right and the USS Constitution Museum. So it's definitely a full day out if you're able to get to central Boston. So with one ship down, let's get on with the rest of the America trip over the course of the year. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.